And now we are pleased to hear from our BYU Nutrition and Dietetics graduate interns today, Kelsey, Jayla, and Lila. They will be speaking about the power of protein. Uh, after the presentation, they will be doing a demonstration on how to make egg muffins. As you can see, there are the recipes on your chairs. Um, and then you'll be able to have a sample of these as well. And then as a reminder, if you haven't already, just make sure that when you're leaving, you click in at the QR code, just scan the QR code. We asked for your net ID so we can keep track of our attendance. Um, I'll turn the time over to our presenters. All right. Welcome everybody, we're excited that you're here. So today we're gonna to be focusing on protein. And so we wanted to start with a poll everywhere. So if everyone you can pull out your phone, scan this QR code, and we're just gonna kind of start out by seeing what you already know about protein. So I'll just give you a minute to, to pull that up. And while we're getting started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Lila. And then this is Jayla in the blue and Kelsey in the black. All right, so that first question is, what is the first word that comes to mind when you think of protein? So go ahead and answer that. Like we see muscle, meat, chicken, influencers. Any other words that come to mind? Yeah, those are kind of the words that come to my mind too when I think of protein. Has everyone had a chance to add their input? Okay, we can move on to the next question. For those of you coming in, we're doing a poll everywhere. You can scan the QR code right here to hop in. How do you proceed to the next one? All right, the next question is, which of the following is an essential amino acid? How do you advance the next question? We we refresh will repeat. activate it. As soon as it's activated, it'll show up on your phone. Yeah. So it is leucine that is an essential amino acid. All right, the next question How much protein do you need in a day? Is it 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, one gram per kilogram of body weight per day, or 0.5 gram? It is 0.8 grams per kilogram is the minimum requirement. What is the AMDR for protein? About how many what percentage of our calories would come from protein? When you're thinking protein, carbohydrate, and fat, what percentage of that macronutrient of your daily intake of calories should come from protein? It's 10 to 35% of total calories. Which of the following has the most protein? Is it one cup of cottage cheese, three ounces of ground beef, one cup of black beans, or two tablespoons of hummus? It is actually one cup of cottage cheese. The three ounces of ground beef and cottage cheese are pretty similar, but the cup of cottage cheese has about four more grams of protein. Vegetarians should consume approximately 10% more protein than estimated requirements to ensure adequate essential amino acid intake. Is this true or false? Yeah. That should say false. <laughs> um, 
All right. The Western diet is typically high in protein and deficiency is uncommon. Is this statement true or false? So here in America, do we usually get enough protein or not? It's true. We usually don't have protein deficiency. This one, what is your favorite source of protein? <laughs> That's a good one. I love bacon. Some bacon in our egg muffins for you. So. These are all great sources of protein. Maybe we can get a few more. Chicken, that's a that's a popular one. Steak. It's at max it won't be low anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. How many grams of protein or how many calories per gram of protein? So each gram of protein has is it four calories, nine calories, or six calories? It is four gram or four calories per gram. All right, just a couple more questions. What is the best timing of protein consumption? Is it evenly throughout the day or having most of our protein at dinner? What is the best? It is evenly distributed throughout the day. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Last question, which of the following is not a benefit from protein consumption? So satiety is a benefit, com competent, um, a component of the immune system and enzymes using used during chemical reactions. Those are all benefits. Cell membrane is not one of the benefits of. <laughs> all right, so that concludes our poll everywhere. We're gonna get into some more details about protein and kind of go a little bit over some of those questions that we asked you and more of the details about that. Okay, well, we are so excited that we have the opportunity to be here today and talk to you about protein and the benefits of protein and different sources of protein. So this is a brief outline of our presentation. We'll be going into first the benefits, different recommendations for different groups of people, sources of protein, including plant-based sources of protein. And then also we're going to do a fun myth busting session at the end, talking about what common myths there are and what does the research say about it. And then we'll do a Q and A at the end. So first the benefits of protein. Protein has a lot of different functions and is very essential for our body. It is, as mentioned on the pool everywhere, it's used in chemical reactions. It's used in as a function of the immune system. And oftentimes when we're in a, we're in a disease state, our, and our protein needs are a lot higher, up to 1.5 grams per kilogram in body weight. It's used in as hormones or as hormone carriers. And also it provides structure for our bones and teeth and helps maintain muscle mass. And it can also be used as an energy source like that pull everywhere question said, we get four calories for every gram. And that's similar to carbs. Carbs is also four calories. And then fat was nine calories per gram. But today we're fo focusing on protein. So you guys may be familiar with the my plate. It replaced the pyramid and we just wanted to put this up there to show an overview, a big picture that protein is important. And it's also an important macronutrient in the big picture with all of the other ones, along with carbohydrates and fat, that we want to have all of them in a balanced diet. So up in, on the screen is the recommendations for protein. It's recommended that the average American gets 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. 
And we'll do a calculation later so you guys can understand how that looks for each individual. And this, the RDA is the recommended daily allowance. And the AMDR is the acceptable macronutrient distribution distribution range. And so that's how many calories should be coming from protein in a day between 10 to 35%. And if you were to do the math, 0.8 grams per kilogram will actually put you right about at the 10%. So that's that, that lowest range. And as you can see, depending on your activity level, endurance, or strength training, your protein needs increase as well. One surprise is that typically American diets are high in protein. And we found, this is from the Dietary Guidelines of Americans. It's from the 2020 to 2025 that has a big, long document publication. And this is research. Right here, this is including fruits, vegetables, grains, and dairy. And the purple dot is what is the average intake compared to the recommended. So as you can see on the last one, total protein foods, males consume above the average and females are right there getting what they need. This is showing what sources of food are going to our protein. So typically meat, poultry, and eggs, typically low in seafood, and then right around there with the nuts and legumes category. Recently at the last year's Utah Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Conference, UAND, Dr. Van Vleit presented on protein and about how there is an optimal dietary recommendation for protein that exceeds what just the RDA is. And he said many within the field of protein metabolism feel the RDA is not per se optimal for health. So it begs to ask the question, should the RDA actually be higher? Not at 0.8, but at 1 or 1 1.2. So we looked into the research and found this study. They pointed out several important discussion points that we wanted to hit on. This is a study published by the Application for Physiology Nutrient Metabolism in 2016 and its protein requirements beyond the RDA. And what they found was they took a bunch of research and they cited all their sources throughout it and summarized and saw that the current evidence suggests that a higher range would be beneficial around the range of 1.2 to 1.6, which as you guys remember, that's about where the endurance athletes lie. But there the recommendation is for all Americans. They also talked about how it's important if we want to reach this goal of a higher amount of protein, then we want to aim to get about a, every feeding period, a, every meal or snack, about 20 to 30 grams of protein and distribute it throughout the day. And in athletes, that recommendation is as high as more than twice the amount of the RDA. <laughs> Especially in older adults, they focused on this and found that it can help prevent age-related sarcopenia, which just means that it helps prevent the loss of muscle mass in that population, having a higher amount of protein. This was also a graph that Dr. Van Vliet showed at his presentation. It's 0.8 is what we were talking about, and that's and the minimum to maintain nitrogen balance. So protein has nitrogen, it's composed of amino acids. And when we eat it, that's with the intake and then we can excrete the nitrogen in our urine. So the balance is where we wanna be at. So we're not at a loss. And that's the 0.8 is enough that we maintain that equal, equilibrium. As we get into the higher amounts, it can be beneficial for the immune system, for recovery for disease and other benefits and the arrows pointing up on the aging and disease is showing that in those populations of even higher amount of protein may be beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. So now Jayla is going to go over how we can calculate this for ourselves. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay. So can everybody get their phone or their calculator out? And there's a little example on the board with Sally. So Sally weighs 165 pounds. 
So she's going to divide her weight in pounds by 2.2 to get her weight in kilograms. And then once you have your weight in kilograms, you want to times that by 0 0.8. And that will give you the number of grams of protein that you need per day. So I'll give everybody a second to calculate that and just kind of keep that in mind as we continue, because I'm going to show you how much protein different food sources have. <clears throat> And then also remember that this is the minimum amount of protein needed a day. And you could also do the calculation for one gram of protein per day, 1.2. If you're an endurance athlete or strength training, maybe your needs are even as high as 1.6. Great. So here in this chart, there are some protein sources and the amount of protein that they have. So I think it's interesting to look at one scoop of a whey protein shake is similar to three ounces of cooked skinless chicken breast, as well as pretty similar to three ounces of cooked 95% lean ground beef. And as we see to the right, we have, or sorry, to the left, the energy in calories is shown along with the grams of protein. So we can see here that one half cup cooked quinoa, that has four grams of protein, that's great. And it has 110 calories, which is about the same amount of calories as the one scoop of the whey protein. And that has 24 to 26 grams of protein. So that doesn't mean that Every food that has less calories and more protein is better. But if you are trying to increase protein in your diet without eating tons more food, these are some interesting foods to look at. Even Greek yogurt is great and eggs. Okay, here's some more examples of what 20 grams of protein looks like. So our friend Sally in the example needed a minimum of 60 grams of protein per day. And so she could have had three eggs for breakfast, then a lunch with some salmon and rice and vegetables. And for dinner, maybe she had chicken breast and some potatoes just to make that full balanced meal. And then she would have gotten her 60 grams of protein in her day. And if she wanted even more, she could have eaten, you know, edamame, tofu, cheese, and with all these things. So this is also something that's really interesting. Too much protein in a meal, is that possible? This is a graph and I can give you the slides later and you can look more in detail into this. So I'm just gonna give you an overview that this is saying that in your meal, having too much protein, for example, 60 grams of protein in one meal, your body won't be able to synthesize it as well as if you split it up throughout the day. And so here's some tips for protein consumption. Typically breakfast, has the lowest amount of protein of any meal. So we want to increase the amount of protein in breakfast for older adults or anybody that needs to increase their protein intake. That way it can be spread throughout the day. It's also great to add it into our snacks. Yes. So if the body can only can, can only process so much protein, what kind of break between meals do you need to be able to have your next dose of protein? <laughs> That's a great question. I actually don't know the specific answer on top of my head. I know that the research has said that between meals, so that is a few hours, but I would love to look into the study more and give you a more specific answer afterwards. And I'd love to hear it. Okay, great. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for that question. One thing that adding protein to breakfast can also do is increase satiety for younger individuals. For example, 
elementary, high school students have been shown to be more focused when they feel full and satisfied throughout the day. Okay. And then plant versus animal protein. Which one's better? I know there's a lot of debate and the um, research points to them both being good. They're both good sources of protein. Anything with protein can help you meet your needs, but there are some pros to animal proteins and some pros to plant proteins. So high quality animal proteins provide essential amino acids, including leucine, which we went over in the poll everywhere. And leucine helps us maximize our muscle protein synthesis. So helps us get the most muscles we can out of our protein. And then it also has fewer calories compared to the plant-based protein sources. Yes, I have a question. What constitutes a high quality protein? I this is a low quality. I understood the high quality protein to be referring to leaner cuts of meat. Um for example, you know, Wagyu steak, that has that's a great food delicacy, but it has more fat surrounding it. And there may be a more specific definition in this study. And I would love to discuss that with you afterwards as well. Any other questions? Thank you. Um and Plant-based protein sources are rich in fiber, which is absolutely essential for our daily diet, and they often contain less saturated fat. So it's great to have a mix of these protein sources, and if you do choose to eat plant-based protein only, you will still be able to meet the requirements for your body for your protein intake. It doesn't matter which source you choose as long as you eat enough. And this is the protein hierarchy. So we've talked a lot about how protein can benefit us. And a lot of people, when they eat protein, they're looking to increase their muscle or their health, make sure they're not deficient in anything. So if you are trying to increase muscle, the first and most important thing you need to do is exercise. You can't gain muscle or prevent the loss of muscle completely by only eating protein. Then the overall amount of protein you have is also super important. Then the protein source. So, you know, with those, maybe it doesn't really matter if your protein source is plant or animal or if it's super high quality or not, as long as you're getting the right amount, that's at, that's something to think about later. And then protein distribution throughout the day is kind of the last thing that you're trying to do. So if you're looking for a way to increase the benefits that you receive from protein, you could start here and think, am I exercising? Am I getting enough? And then if you are, then you can start looking into the protein sources and the protein distribution throughout the day. All right, so now we're going to talk about some maybe common protein myths. So maybe you've heard some of these things, maybe you've wondered about some of these things. So we're just going to break them down just a little bit. Um, so we're going to just go through each one of these individually. And just so you guys are aware, the slides will be available to you afterwards. So you can go back and look through these slides. So first myth, the more protein you eat, the more muscle you'll gain. In some senses, this can be true, but if you're only eating protein and hoping that just eating more protein is going to increase your muscles, that won't work. You need to be doing some sort of resistance strength training because you have to break the muscles down to build them stronger. And when you have the protein available, that will help in rebuilding the muscle. So you do need to be eating adequate protein in order to rebuild muscle. And it's also important that you're getting enough total calories to build. If you're trying to build, you need to make sure that you're eating enough and that you're not in a deficit. Um, and so there was a study that showed that in those individuals who are exercising, those 
who were already eating a good amount of protein, they did a group that had like a, a regular amount of protein and then a group that had way more than was really even needed. And they did not see any difference in muscle strength increase between the two groups. So as long as you're getting enough protein, eating more protein isn't going to increase your muscle strength. Second myth, protein can't make you fat. I know the keto diet has been really popular and maybe some people have this idea that just eating protein won't lead to any sort of weight gain, but the truth is that any sort of excess of calories, no matter what macronutrient is coming from, is going to lead to weight gain and increased fat. The next myth is that you have to have protein as soon as you're done working out. This one is a pretty common belief that as soon as you exercise, you need to hurry and drink a protein shake, maybe even before you leave the gym. And I know that there were some times in my life where I felt like I needed to have protein right away. And going to the research, it shows that you don't need to have it immediately as long as you're eating enough protein throughout the day. Especially if you're going to have a meal within the next hour or two, you're going to be able to get that protein to help your muscles rebuild. Um, and so especially focusing on getting enough protein at breakfast because most people are not getting adequate. They're skipping breakfast or they just grab something that doesn't have any protein in it. And so with this study, they showed um, there were two different groups, those um, healthy young men that were exercising and they had the same amount of protein, but one group had an evenly amount spread. I think it was about 30 grams per meal and then the other group had our typical American skewed diet of having most of the protein just at dinner time. And those who had protein distributed throughout the day did have um, a better um, increase in muscle mass. Yes. How does that work with intermittent fasting? That's a great question. I am not 100% sure. Um, it might depend on the window of how many hours. Um, but it is important to distribute that protein throughout the day. And if you're intermittent fasting, maybe your window's too small. I, I really don't know the exact answer to that. Um, but the research does show it's better to, to spread it out throughout the day because I think the next myth will go into the last, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but there is a myth that high protein diets are bad for your kidneys. So the truth behind this is that Protein does make your kidneys work. They have to work a little bit harder if you're eating more protein. But if you're healthy, this isn't bad for your kidneys. Your kidneys will work just fine. And yes, question in the back. So is there such a thing as too much protein? So what happens when you have too much? There, I don't think there is an upper limit on what's toxic. There's not like a number that's toxic for your body. Um, but if your body can't utilize it for muscle protein synthesis or the other functions, your body, it, it acts as excess. And so your body will convert it to fat or excrete it. Um, I'm sure with anything, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Um, it's smart to practice moderation. Um, but as far as I know, there's no toxic level that has been studied. Any other questions? Okay, so um, this last myth is that the only role of protein is to support muscle growth. This is one of the functions of protein and is a great function of protein, but there are so many other things that protein is, is good for. Um, and we talked about it at the beginning, so just to kind of bring it full circle, protein builds and maintains muscles, bones, joints, ligaments, hair, hormones, all of these things your body needs protein and that's why it's it's essential that we we get that protein and that we get all of the essential amino acids that we need because our body can't make it on its own yes so um you mentioned before that with the standard american diet usually most people get a really high amount of protein but at the same time i mean the standard american diet is not good so saying that most people that eat that way get a lot of protein. I mean, I, I see a little bit of a contradiction there. Yes. So we're not worried about protein deficiency in America because most people are getting enough protein, but they could be 
having more optimal benefits by choosing maybe a healthier source of protein or focusing on spreading it throughout the day if they want to see more benefits from the protein that they are consuming. There just are some healthier practices that we could implement to maximize benefits. Does that answer your question? Yeah, like for example, that whey protein powder that was mentioned earlier. Um, I know that it was higher than the other sources of protein. My question is, it might be higher, but as far as the quality, I mean, are we, I hate anything powder, anything that's <laughs> artificial, but so I'm trying to see where that, what, where are we going with that? So those who have a hard time getting enough protein in, maybe that might be an additional uh, source of protein that they could add into their diet. Maybe older adults who have a hard time chewing tough meat or those who have to be on a strict liquid diet, it could be beneficial for them for athletes that need to get a lot of protein in in a day. Cause like we said, 0.8 is the minimum and we need to be getting more than that if we want to see greater benefits. And so if you're having a hard time getting it from food sources, then that is an option, but you don't have to. Any other questions before I do our demonstration? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Just going along with that. Um, I heard that like with the quality of protein, like, um, the act of chewing and like solid protein forms is like better for absorption than like liquid. Do you guys know anything about that? Isn't it research specifically the exact benefits between each individual protein source? So that's not in our expertise, but from what we have researched, we've understood that, you know, that may, you know, maybe there's an incremental small difference between them, but in general, what people should be focusing on is just getting that protein into the diet. And we don't need to stress too much about how we get it as long as we're getting enough. Because that, and most Americans are getting that 0.8 grams through whatever they're eating. Um, but we just are here to show that the research points to getting more than that in whatever form that it comes. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? We have a demonstration. Ailey's going to show us a high protein breakfast option because most Americans are not getting enough protein at breakfast. So. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to our whole presentation. Hopefully, this next part we can have a little bit of fun. So, how many people in this room typically eat breakfast? Hey, that's a good number. Okay. Love to see that breakfast is a great meal. So my husband and I typically don't have a lot of time in the morning. We really like to get our sleep or go do something um, active in the morning and we rush out the door. So we make these egg muffins all the time. We make them at the beginning of the week and then we just put them in our fridge and take them out as we need them and when we're hungry in the morning. So they are very, very simple to make. Typically what I do is I'll get three fourths cup of shredded cheese and a cup of cottage cheese. I'm making a half batch. So this is a little bit less. Just throw it into the blender. And we're not actually gonna blend this because I don't wanna make too much noise and we didn't We'll, we'll just have you eat the final product. But we'll blend these two ingredients first so that they can get nice and mixed together. We don't put the eggs in yet because if you put the eggs in right now, they'll get a lot of air bubbles in them, which causes them to rise and then fall a lot. So they already rise and then fall when you take them out of the oven, but we're trying to minimize that. So get it in the blender, blend it up, until it's nice and smooth. Then we get eggs, 18 eggs, and just pour them in there. See if I can do this without making a mess. Great. Pour them in there with a little bit of salt and pepper. And you can put any other seasonings that you like in there. We like to use garlic powder sometimes, paprika, 
um, red chili flakes, just kind of depends on our mood. Once it's done blending, we pour it into an already greased muffin tin. The muffin tin that would probably be optimal for this recipe is a silicone muffin tin. I've never used one of those because I don't have it and it's worked just fine in a regular muffin tin. Just make sure that you grease it or butter it, whatever you prefer. Then just pour some in each of them, put it in the oven at 300 degrees for about 30 minutes. And the reason you put it in the oven for so long is even though they might look pretty much done, they will get firmer and stiffer and they will last longer and hold their shape better the longer that you keep them in the oven. And here on the recipe, you can see at the bottom that three of these muffins mix, um, has 250 calories and 21 grams of protein because both cottage cheese and eggs are great sources of protein. And you can pair this with toast or fruit to add more balance to your meal in the morning. But these keep me full for a good amount of time. So we have brought some egg muffins for you and we're just gonna serve them up onto little plates or we can have people come up and serve themselves. But unless anybody has any other questions or anything else that they want to ask us either about the recipe or our presentation. That's that. Yes. Um, is there a difference between the amount of protein that you get to the ratio between lean muscle mass versus your overall body mass? That's a great question. So Kelsey brought up sarcopenia briefly in her slides. Um, sarcopenia is the loss of lean muscle mass, and that can occur if you are eating enough calories throughout your day, but you're not meeting the requirements for protein. You can even, you know, this is definitely something to watch out for in people who are obese or people who are just trying to lose weight, if they're not getting enough protein, their lean muscle mass will get lost, will be lost faster. Um, and that goes back also to the nitrogen balance because more nitrogen from the proteins being excreted than is being taken in. And, but the other way around it's as Lila was saying, as long as you get enough protein in your diet, you will be able to build lean muscle. Does that answer your question? A little bit, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> if you have a follow-up question, feel uh, Well, I mean, just like it, it, for, for those who are training athletes, trained uh, athletes. You know, I, I've read that it's a gram of protein per body weight. Mm -hmm. If you're like 300 pounds, that's like 300 pounds of protein or grams of protein. Yeah. I don't know if it's healthy or not. But if you're training, and everything and you have more lean muscle mass are you trying to uh, keep that ratio for lean mass rather than your overall mass mm. that's a great question i did a, a quite a few uh looked through a lot of studies about building muscle and and protein and um it has to do with the essential amino acids. So a high quality protein source is one that has all of the essential amino acids. Um, and so it, there's, there's so much that goes into each individual and if they're obese and if they're not, and how much you're exercising and what kind of exercise you're getting. Cause resistance training is different than endurance training. And so it's, it is pretty individual. Your body composition might be different than someone else who eats the exact same as you because genetics play into it. There's so much, there's a lot that has been studies, but there is also a lot that is unknown, but your protein will be maintained if you're getting adequate amount. If you have greater muscle mass, you have greater protein needs. Is that answer your question? Any other questions? You guys are welcome to come up and get some of these protein egg muffins. There are little forks over here and napkins. Thank you everyone for coming today. We appreciate being here.